So please welcome uh, Fausto from Price Labs. Thank you. So, as Simon said, uh, my name is Fausto. I work for Price Labs more or less for three years now. Uh, I'm based out of Portugal, but I work with several European and Latin American clients. Uh, the presentation today is focused on some best practice uh, in revenue management. Simon uh, asked who is using uh, revenue management in this room. Uh, it more, it's more or less what we have been, uh, every time we ask, and for some of our data, in some cities as an example, we, use, uh, we, we see that in usually it's still under 30% the amount of, re of revenue properties being, uh, where revenue management is being used in the market. Uh, so, as you, may, as you see, uh, it's very few of the markets that 50% of the properties are using any revenue management or dynamic pricing, so it's something that uh, still a lot to learn, a lot to use, a lot to be implemented. Not sure. Let me see if it works. No. <laughs> Low battery. <laughs> ah, no, okay. Now it's working. Okay, so I will, uh, oh, I'm going to the side better, or else it will not work. I will start with some, uh, with some uh, levers available. So this is like a very quick uh, introduction. So usually, uh, traditionally, the first thing that when setting prices, the, the first step uh, people were uh, usually using was your own past data like both seasonal pricing, day of the week pricing, or holiday event pricing. Uh, this was the most common uh, used tactic to define your pricing for next year. Uh, usually people just say, okay, my past data, I have my seasonal pricing, I have my, my daily pricing, and then next year I will increase 5% or 10% because my market is getting better. Uh, or I, I'm reducing because I'm, uh, it's a, a, a very bad year. So based on the previous year, we were making some decisions. Uh, today, I think the market is much more dynamic. So probably uh, my suggestion is that you change a little bit. It's a good start, but it's better for you to change a little bit the strategy. Also very important, and because these are like fundamentals, like of revenue management, best practice, um, in terms... Sometimes people think that revenue management is something very complicated to start and implement and do the first steps. It's, it's not, okay? As soon as you stop and think about your strategy, you are doing revenue management. Then it can be a more complex or simple uh, strategy, but you're doing revenue management at the moment that you stop and you define a strategy. Even if it's simple and you say, I know 10 events on my market, I will price those 10 events and I will price I don't know, Friday and Saturday, a little bit higher. You are already doing revenue management if you do it with a strategy, okay? Then, first step, your own past data. Second, the market data. For the market data, you already need uh, some uh, tools, usually. Of course, you can do it manually and go one by one to all the listings of your competitors and see the prices they are doing every week, for example, and then next week, see if they are changing prices, but it gets too complicated and a lot of time investment. So you should use a tool, uh, any tool that can give you market data. Then also use your future data. Okay? Uh, the difference between past data and future data is, the, the past data is just to see how the results were, how, how you sold, to know some KPIs like my average daily rate in the past, etc. Your future data, it's very important because everyone should do a kind of a forecast. Uh, even if the forecast is wrong, almost all the forecasts are wrong, but at least you have a forecast. So the forecast will get better as soon as you do more forecasts and you improve a little bit your strategy. But if you don't have a forecast, probably you don't have goals. You are just doing it by intuition. Then you say, I know uh, this summer was very good for me because I made more revenue than last year. But if you made 10% more revenue, but in average your competitors made 30% more revenue, your result was not good. Your result was below average. Okay, so it's important to have to understand the future data and to understand the behavior of, of your properties in the future today. Okay, then working your calendars, gap pricing, and gap minimum stays. It's something very common. People still forget that gaps can improve your rev par, and 
if, if someone doesn't know what is a rev bar, it can improve your occupancy or your average daily rate. Even if you sell lower or higher, depending on your strategy, there's no one rule that works for all. Some people like to increase pricing on a gap. Some people prefer to decrease. I think it depends on your strategy, depend on your goals. For example, if you have a goal of selling a property, the revenue for that property, the goal is 2,000 euros in a certain month, you already have 2,000 euros. Maybe the gaps, if you want to increase it a little bit more, you can do give a discount. Everything is extra. If you just, the logistics in your case, your operation doesn't let you do one night caps, for example, maybe you should still open it, but sell it very expensive. So just try to optimize those gaps. And then some broader policies that uh, it's the new thing in revenue management, right? Before revenue manager didn't count, the, dis the distribution was not as important as it is today, right? Like traditionally the distribution was GDS, some uh, tour operators, etc., uh, travel agencies. And now with so many OTAs, with so many channels, direct bookings, etc., you should have very clear what are your channel markups, your if you want to use length of stay pricing or not uh, to attract, for example, mid-term stays, long-term stays, etc., and understand the fee structures. Okay, very common mistake is okay. I sell a lot in certain OTAs, but then I don't exactly know how, may, how much fees they are charging me. So at the end, I, maybe I'm losing between brackets or not making so much money as I should. Okay. This is uh, an example of uh, the most, as I mentioned, the most common practice and the, the, what, I, what we think that is the, the best practice that you should, you should study the past trends to further adjust pr prices, okay? And you should adjust it today and we'll update. Of course, you sh if you do it manually, you will not be updating prices every day probably for the next year. But e even if you do it uh, manually, you should have a process and it has to be a process. It can be based on intuition. It can be that the reservations manager opens the calendar, sees the next week, and depending on how it is, I will do sometimes 20%, sometimes 15 and then if we ask why, uh, because I think so. It's, it's not the best practice, so we should have a process like. If I know that in the next 15 days, I have less than a certain occupancy, I should give a discount. If not, I will not give that discount, I will give another discount or even increase my price. So it should be something that you do always the same. If you don't do it always the same, you will never know if your strategy is working or not. Because sometimes you do it in a certain way, then on another, and then sometimes you have a better result than a worse result. At the end, you don't know exactly what worked for you. Okay. Okay, I'm just jumping this. Okay. So this, this one I want to focus because it's very important. One of the first steps I think when you are uh, setting a, um, a, a pricing strategy, you should understand the seasonality on your market, and you should understand also the booking window and the, the average length of stay that people are booking. So you should understand the segmentation of a market a little bit, who is coming to the market, how much time are they staying, when are they booking, and then understand what are the months that are really bringing more or less bookings. And also, if you can, and if you have data for it, you should know this by bedroom category, okay? At least this. I know that in some cases, some markets, it's very specific. I have a two bedroom, but 12 people sleep there. So it's kind of a, a different, but at least understand if, if, uh, if your market is very strong for rooms or studios or one bedrooms or two bedrooms or three bedrooms. Why? Because in, in a lot of, in Europe, that uh, the city centers of, uh, of um, main cities are all historical, there's not a lot of three and four bedrooms. And maybe that's the better deal. Maybe, maybe it's where you can make more money because there's less, you will, ha will have less competition and can be your segment of the market. So understanding if wh which market do you want to sell and which market you should invest as well, it's very important to understand to set uh, your pricing strategy. Okay. I just wanted to focus as well on this one because pacing against the market helps identify outliers, okay? So I will just show you a, a, an example. In this black line here, I don't know if this has a laser, I think it is, oh, 
probably not. So this, this black line is your pricing, imagine. Then you have the market percentiles. Basically, the top percentile is high end, uh, the, the low one, it's uh, low end, like the economic side, and if you are in above average. As you can see here, for example, the next graph is the occupancy, and your occupancy and the occupancy of the market. The red line is your occupancy and then the occupancy market. As you can see in the occupancy, the market doesn't have any demand on that where, where you can see the arrow. Okay? You don't have uh, demand as well, so your property is behaving like the market, it's normal, but you're still pricing. But for example, your competitors are still pricing very high. Okay? So having, uh, understanding this probably, who is setting here the prices, it's wrong. Okay? He's setting prices very high, in spite there's no demand in the market. So if you, if you are pricing lower, you are uh, doing the right uh, pricing strategy. But for example, here, when the occupancy increases a lot, you should price very high. Okay? So as you mentioned, and this is an example where you can see from a difference of two days. Maybe one is a Wednesday or Thursday, and the other is the, the weekend. So doing this manually for all the year, it's very complicated. That's why my suggestion for everyone is to start use tools. It doesn't matter which tool. If it works, you should use tools, you should use data. Okay? Doing this manually, it's a little bit complicated. I, wa I wanted to uh, also talk about the minimum stays, okay? And when I say minimum stays can be strategies. You should have different minimum stay strategies depending on your booking window, depending on the seasonality as well, depending on, uh, on your market and each listing, the size of the listing, etc. But you should also, you can also do very simple steps to sometimes increase and, uh, your occupancy and your results. I can give you a, ver uh, uh, um, a very simple example. Uh, usually, if you have um, a market that sells very well the weekends, uh, sometimes people have a lot of checkouts on Sunday. And then you just lose the night from Sunday to Monday, for example. You don't sell it, right? You can very easily send an email to everyone that is checking out on a Sunday. Some P PMSs probably you can even automate this and say, if you want to extend your stay for one or two nights, I will give you 50% discount. Okay? You already have the guest in-house, inside the apartment. You don't have to do a cleaning. You don't have to do a check-in. The guest will just stay one more night or two nights. So instead of having a cleaning, sending a cleaning lady, for example, on a Sunday, you can send it on a Monday, and you will give a much cheaper night to someone that else is already in-house. Probably that night you will not sell it. Uh, of course, if in your market you have a lot of check-ins on Sunday, you should not do this. But if you don't, it's just having... That, that client is already cheaper. You don't have to pay an OTA to get it. You don't have to do a check-in. You don't have to do a checkout. You don't have to do new communication. So it's much cheaper than a, than a new client. So it's already someone that is in-house. This one I will not focus in spite. I think that everyone should stop whoever uh, grows the portfolio should stop working each unit individually, okay? You should start to do a segmentation of your properties, a segmentation of your market. If you have a lot of one bedrooms in the same area, you should have a strategy for the group of one bedrooms, not for every one bedroom that you have. Of course, I understand that if you have different prop uh, owners, etc., you have to deal with them, but at the end, you can do some, uh, some specific strategies for the group. And to, uh, just to end, uh, setting a higher minimum stay for the future, I think it's very important as well. Very common mistake. Uh, markets that, uh, that are very weak and strong, like I have a lot of uh, weekends sold. You are selling a Friday and Saturday, for example, for six months in advance, five months in advance, seven months in advance. You already lost the opportunity to sell three days or four days, etc. a longer weekend, okay? Because you would just have the calendars blocked always. Okay? And we'll just... And, and just wanted to show you the last, that is basically a circle that, what I was mentioning, forecast, optimize, have control, and monitor, okay? Don't forget to monitor. Usually it's something that we forget, and for forecast as well, so we just do optimize and control, optimize and control, but then we don't monitor and don't forecast. So important as well. And it's the end. Thank you, uh, Fausto. There was already a lot of practice in there in your presentation. I would love to see a two-bedroom 
apartment where 12 people are staying. <laughs> uh, that's definitely not my style. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you so much. Very interesting. I've <clears throat> so now it's time for a Q&A. <clears throat> we have a microphone on the floor, um, which you can raise your hands, and, and, and it will be passed around. If you do have a question, please make sure you state your name and the company you're uh, working for so people get a bit of context. To get this going, I always confuse, you talk about, in vacation rental, we talk about REFPAR, right? But that's actually a term that comes from hospitality. Shouldn't we call it something else? Or is it all about the actual property, REFPUP? Or is it REFPAR? And what is the difference? Um, me, personally, if I, if I will decide, I will call it revenue per unit. Uh, we'll probably call it revenue per unit. But REFPAR is the most common in the, in the PMSs, RMSs, etc. But if, if it was me, I will call it revenue per unit. Uh, I, also, I also saw in some place revenue per listing uh, also as well. So at the end, the, the concept is the same, but uh, yeah, revenue per room, you, you are not selling rooms usually. I mean, that's, it's not a minor issue, right? People yeah. get already confused with that. And uh, I'm, I'm with you. So revenue per unit or revenue per property, uh, I think mm -hmm. makes a ton of sense. Uh, you mentioned something like in terms of how you go about revenue management with the steps on your first slides, you talk about, uh, in most cases, forecasts are wrong. Mm -hmm. Why are forecasts wrong? Is it because it's badly executed, people don't know how to forecast, we're looking at the wrong data, or why is that? I, I think it's a little bit a mix of everything. I think it, may, it, it is necessary to have practice and study a little bit to improve the forecast. I think experience will make you... Uh, do better forecasts as well. Experience not in the market. Experience doing forecasts. Okay? As much forecast as you do, you will learn of the mistakes. But sometimes I think it, it is also because of the, um, the quality of the data may, might affect uh, the market data and our own data. Sometimes the way we work our data is not the correct. The way the source of our market data is not the correct. So that makes that the forecast gets a little bit more complicated. But my first step, I think, is to learn how to, how to do a forecast. What, what will I need to set on a forecast? Um, but of course, at the end, there will always have a margin of error, right? Because the market, it's volatile, so it might change. Um, I've, I've, before I was working in this industry, I've worked in hotels, and I've all, all, also seen like forecasts with 20% margin error, and some that had three, four, five, that is very good. Uh, so it's impossible to, I think, 100% correct, but having a low margin of error in a forecast, I think it's important. So you say anything around 5% margin error is pretty good. I important. think it's acceptable, yeah. Absolutely. I yeah. think that's pretty good, Pretty too. good, yeah. <laughs> Every, everything under 10%, I think it's good. <laughs> okay, excellent. Excellent. Now, we, we talked about, you, 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 you mentioned this first question I had for you to say, okay, what are the revenue management used practices within the vacation rental industry? And, and it stuns us as well uh, with our company, you know, providing consulting to these to a lot of property management companies, that the adoption is still is still below 50%. Let's yeah, let's use that, you know, depending on markets and whatever, it might be even lower. That adoption of revenue management practices within the businesses out there is you know definitely below 50, if not below 30%. Why is that? I mean, when we see you know we've optimized distribution, we've done the right thing on the channel management side, we have all our technology set up, but revenue management is still, in the, in, from a tech adoption standpoint, still not there. What is the main reason? Why is that? Uh, I think, in my personal opinion, I think mainly three reasons. One, I think people's, some property managers are still very pragmatic about the data. Uh, they, there's a kind of, uh, I know my market, so I'm, work, I'm working in this market for 20 years, for 30 years, so I know the, I know the data, I don't need the data that someone else will give it me. The thing is that it's different data. What we learn by experience is how the market behaves, where to find a maintenance guy at midnight, where to find someone to solve an issue. We don't understand the market as a macro, like we, we, even based on our experience, we, we do not know how 2,000 listings in a market are behaving. So I think it's a, a little bit, people are still a very pragmatic. The other thing, I think people think that revenue management is more complicated than what it, what it is. Um, and the, it can be very complicated, but you can start it very simple as well. Uh, you can automate a lot of the process as well. So I think uh, that's the two main reasons. The third one, um, it's the, I, I also think that is very common, that is, I don't have time to do it. I don't <laughs> have time to implement a tool. I don't have time to look at it. Yeah. 
but you know that impacts your bottom line immediately, right? Yeah. And we talk about profitability in our industry and actually have tools and ways and means to actually improve profitability is quite substantial. I want to pick up on the second one. You mentioned uh, you know, automation. So looking at your presentation and seeing many other revenue management presentations, I mean, literally, we're still far away from revenue management without human interaction, right? Yes, yes. I think that the tool, it's a complement to the, to the human that is making the final decision. A every revenue management system needs someone to give their input, give, needs someone to check and adjust the strategy. Um, of course, there is a lot of things that can be automated on the data side and on the just automation side, opening and closing calendars, this kind of thing. But at the end, you set the strategy. Okay? The, the, there's n the software will not set the strategy. You will set the, set the, the strategy at the software, and the software will do what you want, but based on data that you don't have. Uh, so it's just a complement to your needs and a complement to whatever you all are already doing. It, okay? Just that it just does it much quickly and with information that we don't have. Any questions from the floor? Please raise your hand. There's one here. I mean, I'll just say, if you're going to base your, your forecast on the last two years' numbers, then good luck to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but that's, a, that's a good example. When COVID started, like the big like, uh, consulting companies, right, they gave forecasts for the economy. They were all wrong, right? So even the most, the biggest uh, companies in the world with millions and millions and millions of of, uh, of dollars and euros paying to some consultants and some data analysts, and they were all wrong. Like PwC, the lot, everyone was wrong about COVID and about how the economy was going to behave. So uh, it's very hard to do a good forecast. Of course, when you do it in a micro level, it gets a little bit easier. Please. Hi, I'm Virginia. Um, I've used your product for years. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so on the automation question, where I'm stumped every time when I onboard a new property, your maximum price is so far out of range of what is the area competition and the, the, the low, your lowest recommended rate. So this is where automation ends, and I have to just guess. Can you speak to that, the, the, the recommended highest price point, point and lowest? Yeah. I think the max price, it's more to manage expectations than price. So it depends on what you want as an expectation to your guest. I can give you an example. Imagine that you use your OTA and you have that when, you, when a, a guest gives you a rating, right? They will have a value for money, right? So if your price is too high, even if you sell it, it's high demand, you sell it very, very high, but you start to get the, the value for money at seven, at six, and whatever, rating. And it decreases your rating. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe you prefer to sell a little bit cheaper, uh, yeah, like a lower rate, but you keep the, the value for money at eight, nine. That's the max price. The, in reality, there's no max price. The market will tell you the price. But you should set a max price if you think that the expectation created to a guest will make him not the experience be worse. So. If I, I know that 300 is, is the max, if I sell more than 300, someone will start to complain. Maybe that's your max price. But it's, there's no rule. You, you have to decide your max price based on the expectations that you want in your guest. If you have a property that you usually have, like a lot of direct bookings, a lot of people from companies, you don't need the OTA rankings, and it's, maybe you don't need a max price because you will have some other way of negotiating. If you focus on certain OTAs that it's important for you to have a 8 point something or 9 point something or 4.7 or 4.8 and you want to keep it, maybe you should se set a max price if it starts to decrease your rating. But I, I, I don't think it's related to pricing. I think it's related to expectation. Nothing else. Any more questions from the floor? Everybody a bit shy today or you know everything about revenue management. That's great too. <laughs> Um, let's talk about channels as well. You know, that's always a very big challenge when we're pushing for direct bookings while we're working also uh, with OTAs, with different commission models, et cetera, et cetera. How, I mean, this is a very generic question, a high level question. What, what do you recommend for people to do uh, in, in making sure that they're not being lost because it's all about profitability and customer acquisition costs, et cetera, et cetera? Because one thing 
that we are very adamant about is looking really at, at margin contribution and not just at revenue. Where is revenue management today? Because one argument that we always had is from the, ho the hotel industry, revenue management is sort of detached from the operating cost. In, in vacation rental, we say actually, when you have 70% of your costs are actually fixed costs because you have owner payments, it becomes very relevant, mm -hmm. right? Where do you see revenue managers picking up more on the gross margin contribution and, and profit side versus just revenue? Is that something gonna happen? I think it is, but I think it, it's even more complicated. Um, like, I think that's the second step. Like, people will start doing revenue management, uh, maybe the first step. When it gets to, prof uh, to, to getting profit, understanding, and that, I think you should, and I think it's also something that a lot of, a lot of uh, property managers don't do, you should understand your cost of operation. For example, even to use a system like Price Labs, to set your minimum price, you need to understand your costs. How much does my operation cost? For example, in that we, we still need, we have a lot to learn with hotels. Hotels know exactly how much a cleaning costs, right? They, they know exactly that a cleaning lady will clean 10 to 12 rooms in one day. They know exactly what each booking each day, what is the cleaning cost, what is the electricity cost, what is everything, all the costs. So they know exactly what is the break-even point that they can use and the price that they need to set to be profitable. I think for property manager, it's a little bit more complicated to do some of these things because it's decentralized operation, this kind of, but you, you can do a lot of this as well and you need to understand the costs. With OTAs and distribution, you should of course do not sell only one OTA, you should have more <laughs> channels to sell, OTAs, direct That's why booking, booking is just leaving now. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you, you, you should sell through different OTAs, you should diversify, but you should also understand how much is each OTA charging you for that. They need to charge, it's their business, right? But you need to understand how much it is and you need to cover those costs in operation. Uh, you should not be very happy that you have 100% occupancy because an OTA is sending you all the clients but at the end you pay 30% commission. It's not a good deal, okay? Unless you are selling very, very much. Excellent, so this is a great takeaway here especially thinking about financial hygiene, think about uh, pro um, profitability as well. I've, we have seen property managers who price uh, weekend stays uh, below their cost, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, or actually above their cost, which is pretty scary. We have a final question here from the floor, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah. Please state your name and um, which company you're working from. Hello, hello, I'm João Carlos. I'm a revenue manager of Cadenza Lux. Uh, from Portugal, um, you were talking about the, the, the using the tool price lab, for example, to um, to increase the bookings. Um, why don't we uh, and we don't we put a minimum price? We have our minimum price. Imagine that you have a property owner that has a price that he don't, doesn't want to to touch. Okay. We we can still use that tool putting the minimum price of the property owner and we should focus on the maximum price, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? Um, but it, this is just to, to know about like, you can, you can put the price as much higher that you want, but you need to understand first, how, how much should mm -hmm. I charge for my property? How much my property can sell it? Mm -hmm. Because the property owner can say, I want to rent for 1,200. But you're pro but we can say okay it's one thousand two hundred but we can ask more for it but yeah. instead of we tell the property owner that we will put one hundred one thousand to three hundred let's just try the market mm -hmm. we put one thousand two hundred and we put as minimum and we try to put it one thousand four hundred and see how the market behaves and then set a new price on next year okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, th I think it's not about the minimum price and w we should be talking about the, the, the revenue, okay? The tools, uh, I think the tools serve, uh, if they are not good, uh, the person do don't know how to use it, they will lose money and they are not knowing that they are losing money. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a super great point. Yeah. You know, including the homeowners into this conversation, yeah. right? <laughs> 
No, uh, so I think every time you use dynamic pricing, you should work the minimums, okay? You, sh you should not work the recommended price manually because or else you are doing changes to the algorithm. The, the idea is the algorithm to work. You should set things for the algorithm to work as you want as with your results. You should control your minimums. You can have minimums per season, per weekend, per, I don't know, each day, date specific overrides, all of that. So, but you should understand the minimum because at the minimum can be based by the owner, said, this is my minimum, and then I will optimize, or based by your operation. I know my operation cost, so my minimum is this. Um, of course, at the end, the price, the average price of the property is the market that will decide, and you should optimize it. Deciding if you have a max or not, it's for expectations, not for revenue. If you, don't, if you want to optimize revenue and doesn't care about expectations, you should optimize only revenue. Of course, that setting the, the rate, it will be based on what the market, uh, how the market behaves, and also in which segment is your property uh, located at the market. So one of the most common mistakes, and this is common in every country, that every, every time I speak to people, is sometimes owners or property managers don't really know exactly in which segment their property is. They think, hey, my property is above average. Why do you tell this? I know because I like my property. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's not, uh, my property is very nice. Yeah, but maybe the others are nice as well. The guests will say and the market will say that your property is above average. If it is, you should price it above average. If it isn't, you shouldn't. Um, it's not based on what we want, it's based on what the market say, say to us. Mm -hmm. So I understand that the minimum is not, the minimum is just for you to be profitable. <laughs> Like you have to understand the minimum. Like yeah. it's just that. The, the 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 only thing is that you put the minimum up to the owner, uh, but you still have a f an extra fee above the Airbnb fee or Booking.com fee. Mm -hmm. You have an extra fee from PiceLab, so you need to really know your minimum because otherwise you will be you exactly. will be losing more commission. So you are using a tool to have imagine that if I put a, a lower price to try to see if it rents even 100 euros below the price, mm -hmm. I'm losing not just 100, I'm losing 100 plus the commission, plus the commission price labs. That's, that's why okay. sometimes the best decision of revenue management is saying no to an owner. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Thank you very much. We need to be time here, so thank, say no to an owner. Perfect takeaway for this break. And also, it's not about perception, it's about the market data. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank me, Fausto Silva.